Welcome to Breaking Bread with Gabby and Allie. I'm Gabby Loren. And I'm Allie Valerio. And we have a very special guest on the line. His name is Rudy Rockman. He is not only an advocate for Jewish rights, but he's also an advocate for human rights. And he has tons of content that he posts on his social pages, whether it's Facebook or YouTube. I know that you have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. You have 4,000, I think, on YouTube and over 60,000 followers on your Facebook pages but you're creating some real change. Um, and it's so important, the message that you're bringing to people, um, not only for, for Jewish people and people that identify with Judaism, but for people that have no knowledge or education on Judaism at all. So thank you so much, Rudy, and uh, please introduce yourself. Well, thank you for having me and for giving uh, uh, this information, this knowledge, and me as an individual platform to be able to speak about uh, my issues. Uh, to introduce myself, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about my, my background. I was born in France. Uh, all of my grandparents were born in different countries, uh, Morocco, Algeria, Poland, and Belgium, and were all persecuted and expelled out of their countries because they were Jews and they weren't Polish, they weren't Belgian, they weren't Algerian, they weren't Moroccan. Uh, my mom's side of the family is the Sephardic North African uh, side with the experience in North Africa. There was uh, a pogrom in Ujda, which is a city in Morocco, uh, that basically massacred the Jewish community there as a reaction to the creation of Israel in 1948. So because the Jews finally were able to self-determine in their homeland, the reaction of the Arab community that was the local community, of course, this does not define all Arabs. This does not define Islam. This does not define Morocco or the king. It wasn't even done through the government. It just defines the particular community that was surrounding and not even that entire community, right? But because of that experience, they had to flee to France. My dad's side of the family survived the Holocaust by fleeing from Poland and hidden attics throughout the war in France. So both sides of my family were persecuted for being who they were, which is Jewish. Uh, I was born in France, moved to Israel when I was three with my family. When I was five, my family decided to move to America. Uh, we lived in Miami and Palo Alto and LA and New York. And my family also left to Singapore for a year. But most of my early childhood experience was in Miami, which is a very particular place of America because no one really identifies as American in Miami, even if you're born in Miami, even if you're second generation uh, born in Miami, you're not really American, you're Argentinian, you're Venezuelan, you're Haitian, you're Colombian, you're Cuban, you're Jamaican, you're all these different identities, and you relate more to what your ancestors or what you brought into this country, the chapter before coming into here. So growing up, I was always labeled the French kid. Yes, my family had very thick French accents. So obviously when my friends saw my parents dropping me off in school, they associated me to being uh, French. When you would ask, uh, where are you born? I would say France. So I guess that makes me French. And when I'd visit family in France, I was the American cousin. And I'm also half Ashkenaz and half Sephardic and Moroccan and Algerian and Belgian and Polish and Israeli and Jewish and all these different identities. And I was very frustrated because apparently when someone was asking me, where are you from, which is the one of the most popular questions you get when you first meet someone, the answer depended on who was asking me that question. And that developed a huge frustration in me at a very early age because I was always someone that wanted to dig deeper and to find the, tr the truer answers or the truest answers that you can find. I don't think anyone has uh, the ultimate truth. Um, but for me, in my experience of trying to, to struggle and to wrestle with that, uh, the answer started to come when I had my first experience with anti-Semitism. Uh, I took a trip to London with my mom and my younger brother when I was seven. My brother was five. Uh, the bus driver saw that we were Jews since my mom was wearing a shirt that was written in Hebrew. And he asked my mom, is that written in Jewish? And she said, no, it's written in Hebrew, but it's the language of the Jewish people. He's like, oh, so you guys are Jews? And she's like, yes. And when he found out that we were Jews, he physically threw us off the bus. And that moment was very shocking to me. Uh, I was not prepared for that. And although I had grown up with uh, anti-Semitism secondhand because I was hearing stories of my grandparents. I was hearing stories of my cousins dealing with anti-Semitism still living in France, but I had never yet experienced something face on myself. And that moment changed my life. It first of all taught me that the next moment that I'd experienced something like this or similar to this, I'd have to be prepared. I'd have to be prepared physically. I'd have to be prepared emotionally. I'd have to be prepared intellectually. I'd have to be prepared even ideologically, understanding the greater ideas as to why this is even happening. And the second thing that it did for me, which I uh, cherish very much so, is it taught me in one moment who I was. It didn't matter 
where I was born, where I grew up, where I lived in, where I traveled to, where I resided in, what passport I had, which really were all different answers to these different questions. It mattered who I was. And who I was also didn't matter to uh, being religious or not, right? That person didn't ask my mom, uh, do you practice Judaism? Didn't ask my mom, do you keep Shabbat? Do you uh, practice uh, the, the religious elements of that culture? They just, what was important was that I was a Jew. So I started asking myself questions after that. And I said, well, you know, I grew up now uh, being told that Judaism is this religion. And if I look up the definition of a religion, it literally states the belief system in a God, deity, book, or a prophet, which makes sense. But in every single religion, if you look at Christianity, if you reject Jesus, then you're not a Christian. And in order to become a Christian, all you need to do is accept Jesus and within a minute you're a Christian. And if you reject the teachings of Buddha uh, or Buddha himself, then you're not a Buddhist. And if you just accept Muhammad in the Quran and you recite a, a, a one-line prayer and you wash your ears and your feet and your, and your hands, then all of a sudden within one minute you become a Muslim. And so I understood that religions are belief systems that cross over borders onto many different nations. You take a, a Argentinian Christian and a Nigerian Christian and a Chinese Christian, all the same belief system, but different nations, different histories, different cultures, different experiences, different languages, different aspirations. But when I started to look internally to my experience with being a Jew and Judaism, even if you don't believe in the Torah, which is our Bible, or if you don't believe in, in the concept of God and Hashem, you're still a Jew. And in order to become a Jew, yes, we have something that you can convert to becoming a Jew, but it's not just adopting a belief system. It's joining a collective of a nation by going through a, a very long and hard process of adopting the history, adopting the culture, adopting the language, adopting the belief system, adopting the identity, adopting even the suffering that comes along with now being a Jew and adopting the aspirations that this nation has. So it's, it's way greater than, than just accepting a religion. So I realized that really a religion is a belief system just a belief system for any people. And Judaism isn't just a belief system, it's way more than that. And it isn't for any people, it is for one people. And the Jewish people are a physical descendant of a place called Judea. And in order to preserve their identity, because other, like a religion is a, as a, a belief system that crosses over borders, where we, are, where we were a physical nation, we're forced to cross over those borders from an original homeland that we came from. And when we were displaced, we created a portable suitcase called Judaism. And ism is a man-made thing. So Zionism, feminism, communism, Marxism, capitalism, these are all man-made structures, racism even, man-made structures that exist. And so what is Judaism? It's basically, we lived in a civilization called Judea. That was the last name of our civilization. And when we left that civilization in order to preserve our identity, our way of life, our culture, our language, our history, our aspiration of coming back home, our relationship with that home, our relationship with a higher power, everything combined into one, we created a portable suitcase called Judaism and passed it down generation to generation with the aspiration of one day next year in Jerusalem coming back home and reviving that civilization. And so through that process and that experience, I started to understand that the only reason I'm called a Jew and Jew also comes from the word Judah, which is a tribe. I come from the tribe of Levi. So why am I even a Jew? But the answer I understood was I came from a civilization that at that time was called Judea. And if the civilization today is called Israel, which is actually the proper name of both the land and the nation as a whole, including my tribe, that makes me Israeli. Now, when we say uh, Israeli, Israelite, uh, Israel, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, Hebrews, uh, you know, Jews, these are all different words that are talking about the same people, the same family, the same nation. And so I realized that, okay, if the only reason I'm called a Jew is because the name of my land was Judea, if the name of my land today is Israel, then I'm Israeli. And so from that moment on, whenever someone would ask me, um, where are you from? They weren't asking me where I was born, grew up, lived in travel to, resided in, or what passport I had. They were asking me, where is your culture from? Where is your collective identity from? Where is your history from? Where is your future from? And yes, I had a history displaced through my ancestors elsewhere, but their core, their stem came from Israel. So my answer was Israel. Um, uh, grew up most of my life again in the United States. Uh, during high schools, even I would throw uh, parties and raise money and give it to the FIDF and Already at a very young age, I felt this connection to uh, a, a struggle that my people were dealing with and felt that, okay, now I'm living in this generation in this chapter of this struggle, and I need to find a way to leave my mark and to play my role with the abilities that I have and that I will grow to have even more and to help spread light in whatever way, both in the micro and macro level. 
uh, age 17, I graduated high school and joined the army also at 17. Uh, for me, although I was technically a volunteer into the IDF, uh, for me, the way I always saw it is that I'm Israeli. Everyone in Israel has to go and defend their country and make sure that the country can be a home for everyone and also the non-Jews that exist there as well. They're also part of the Israeli civilization. So to protect the civilization for all populations living in this land. And for me, it wasn't a choice. It was an obligation. So I went and I served in the paratroopers unit. And when I finished the army is where my activism evolved into the next stage, uh, which I started school at Santa Monica College and UCLA. Uh, Santa Monica College is, you know, a place that people usually go in and out. They don't really stay. Uh, but UCLA was where most of my activism took place. And there were movements that existed against Israel, which made me uh, give in my weapon where I was a combat soldier and had to develop now a different weapon, which was my tongue, the ability to express myself and to narrate. And uh, many questions arose there, which I struggled to, to deal with them and found answers. And after my year there, uh, which we can touch more and go more in depth if we want to, but after my year there, I went to Asia to backpack and to explore different cultures. A big part of my upbringing was also travel. Uh, I'm very lucky to have been granted the uh, ability to experience different cultures, different histories, different ideologies and languages in order to understand this vast world that we live in. And you know, for me, traveling is such an important part of my life. Uh, not only to go to a place and to stay in a five-star hotel and, and have a nice picture for Instagram, but really uh, dive deep into the histories and, and the culture and, and the language and the values. And I, I, I can share one thing of my trip when I spent a year in Asia is that when I was in India, I spent a month and I took a week to live in the slums with a family uh, that was extremely poor in order to experience what that was like. And I found such beauty in that experience because um, at the end of my, my week, I asked the, the family that, you know, he was living under this like uh, tin sort of like metal sheet roof with some blocks and barely had any money to put clothes on, on his kids and, and, and food and asked him, how are you so happy? And he said, I'm not happy based on what I don't have, but based on what I do have. And I can see and I can hear and I can walk and I can talk and my kids have life. And that's what gives me happiness not the pursuit of what I don't have, but the understanding and the appreciation of what I do have. And I think that's a very beautiful concept. And I do think there's also a balance. We do need to aspire to, uh, you know, build a better life and have, you know, greatness in, in many different ways, both spiritually, intellectually, and materialistically. That's also a part of something that exists. But there has to be a balance and understanding also, what do we have and what do we appreciate? After my year in Asia, I decided to transfer to finish my uh, studies at the time, uh, I was having all sorts of conversations with different people going to uh, transferring to different schools and also the parents of, of, of my peers going to schools, uh, particularly also in the Jewish community. And they were saying, oh, I don't want my child to go there. It's too anti-Semitic. I don't want my child to go here. It's too anti-Israel. And I was like, well, that's where we're supposed to go. Like, if we're not going to go there, then this is just going to get worse. So I literally went on Google and typed in in 2016, number one most anti-Semitic school. And there was a list produced in 2016 of top anti-Semitic schools. Columbia University was the first one. So I was wow. like, that's where I'm going to transfer to. And so I transferred to Columbia. I started a movement there uh, that was grassroots, that was focused on not being uh, just for Jews. We had many non-Jews within our board. We had uh, two Muslims uh, that was an award, one from Iran and one from uh, Bangladesh. We had uh, other non-Jews that were not Jewish and not uh, Muslim. Uh, it was a very inclusive group that focused on uh, doing three things, to empower, to narrate, and to protect. To empower the Jewish people uh, and giving a space for our allies to do that as well through education, through uh, learning how to debate, learning how to intellectually have conversations, how to understand other narratives, how to understand other people having similar struggles that we now can play a role in helping them be empowered. Uh, the second was to narrate, being able to uh, tell our story in a language that fits with the generation that we exist amongst. The generation uh, on college campus talks a language of liberation, and humanity and, and compassion and something that is way deeper than just accomplishments, which is a language that the previous generation was talking in. You know, you do good things, you, you, you've you accomplished well, it means you're the right person. And our generation wants to dig in deeper, like, yeah, you might have something, but that doesn't necessarily make you the right person. It means what are your actions and what did you do in order to get there? 
and to ask deeper questions, which we can explain Israel's story in that language, which the way we articulate it is the story of Israel is the story of a 4,000 year old native people that came from the land of Israel slash Judea. And they were physically displaced and persecuted and colonized by a Western white imperial nation called the Romans. And during their displacement, while they still maintain a constant presence in their land, they were persecuted and oppressed and even exterminated in many different uh, uh, civilizations that they existed outside. And eventually they created the most successful indigenous liberation movement that ever existed, where they were able to revive their language, revive their civilization, and finally come back home. And that's the story of Israel, a story that not only has achieved so much, but also empowers and inspires other minorities across the world. Um, so yeah, graduated from Columbia. This movement eventually spread through many different campuses. I think it's about 50 different campuses today. Um, and as I was at Columbia, I started making videos, uh, debating people and allowing my experience to be shared uh, for other people to, to experience that, to hear what others were saying, to learn about what works in responding and what doesn't work in responding. And I wasn't born with this. You know, I made a lot of mistakes along the way. I said a lot of things when I was debating that I realized, okay, this is an argument that doesn't work because I'm speaking from my echo chamber and I'm not understanding the way that someone else sees the world. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of imposing my worldview on them and they're not understanding what I'm saying. It's going right above them. So how can I understand their perspective, the world, their worldview and their truths and their experience and communicate my message and, and create a, a reality that doesn't have to be contradicting and doesn't have to be opposing. And it's a process to get there. Um, right, so that so was actually I what I was to going these... to ask you next. Like, where yeah. did you get this yeah. knowledge from in regards to like the narration and the way in which to speak to people? Where, what qualified you for this? Did you take classes? Is it just life experience? It's all of the above. Uh, it's the things that you read, the conversations that you have, the classes that you go to, uh, the experiences that you have and the conclusions that you have. I don't think knowledge comes from one source and I don't think anyone has all the answers. I definitely have much more to learn and much more to grow. Um, but for me, I think the start of it all, uh, besides that, that original question of who am I uh, through that anti-Semitic experience is whenever I would go to something that's, you know, a lot of my videos are at the APAC policy conference, and there's these protesters. I remember in middle school, my dad took me to one of these conferences and I was inside listening to these speakers. And of course, there's a lot that I personally disagree with APAC, like the two-state solution, uh, the, the US foreign aid to Israel and how it's structured that forces Israel to be dependent on America and allows America to impose policies onto Israel that are not uh, beneficial to the populations living on the ground. But I was at this conference and I was hearing these politicians and these leaders saying like the same thing. You know, I, I remember one time uh, uh, one person got up and said, a strong Israel is a strong America. And everyone got up and gave a standing ovation. And then a strong America is a strong Israel right after. And everyone got up and gave a standing ovation. And I was like, at a young age, I'm like, that has no depth. That means nothing. You guys are just speaking to yourselves. And yes, I agree with you that Israel needs to be strong, but you're not really saying anything. And I, and I want to learn something. I came here to learn something. So what did I do? I actually went outside with the protesters and that's where I started to engage a whole new perspective that I had never engaged with before. And I wasn't there fighting them. I was there engaging with them, understanding their ideology, understanding their perspective and those that were completely anti-Semitic, obviously learning how can I defend uh, my narrative and my people's story and expose them through their own words and what they're saying. And those that actually generally cared about Palestinians, well, I never was raised hating Palestinians, but I was also never raised experiencing Palestinians. What is their story? What is their perspective? What, are, what is their experience? And what is their aspirations and, and, and everything that I never really was, was connected to or, or aware of? And finding that out and, and, and being able to understand what works and doesn't work. And through that experience, I think is what led me to wanting to go to the places that were the hardest, uh, not only to defend Israel in the best way, but for me to find truths uh, in places that no one was ever looking for. Wow. Can you delve a little bit deeper into, a lot of people are very disconnected from their Judaism, and I see that you've taken it upon yourself to really educate yourself. What should people be doing to educate themselves about their history and their past, and like, what is your mission that you just continue to um, pursue? Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh... Growing up, I've always had uh, several goals to my life. Uh, some are more personal and some are more for a collective. Uh, my first goal is to uh, get married with a strong Jewish woman and to have many 
uh, strong, healthy uh, Jewish children. That's one goal. Uh, second goal is to be successful in my own route, whether that's uh, uh, mentally, whether that's uh, you know intellectually, whether that's being also physically and, and, and economically, financially successful. Uh, and then an element of, of what I, ch I try to do is I, I understand that I'm an individual within this generation of Jews. And I think that we have had many chapters of Jewish history. I exist in this chapter, which is a post-Zionistic chapter, meaning the goals of Zionism of returning back to Zion, to Jerusalem, was already accomplished. Now we have to have a conversation of what does that mean? And figuring out what are the struggles that we deal with internally, what are the struggles that we deal with externally, and how can I use what I have and what I will acquire along the way of my life to better help us push forward in Jewish history. And so I think that's my goal. Uh, the way it you know, was revealed on college campuses was sort of being an ideological leader for the younger generation of Jews to, uh, and allies to wake up uh, realize who we are, what is our history, what is our culture, how do we narrate that, how do we empower that, how do we fight against anti-Semitism, how do we create a better reality moving forward. And in Israel itself, there's a whole other conversation. How do we transcend the conflict that exists between the Israelis and Palestinians, right? It's not going to be one state or two state. It's going to be something in between. It's going to be a reality where we both end the injustices that we experience and fulfill the aspirations that we require. And they actually don't contradict. And it starts also, again, with having that conversation building relations with Palestinians, understanding their struggles, their experiences, having them understanding our struggles and our experiences, and then together building something. And also within Israeli society, external to Palestinian conflict, there's so much division. We've become ideological tribes today. Once upon a time, we were physical tribes. Today, we're ideological tribes, the left against the right, uh, secular against religious. And I just spoke about this in a webinar uh, recently. But if you look at these different tribes, they all have a truth to them. The left is talking about humanity, rights, justice, uh, liberation, caring about others. The right is talking about, in Israel, this is not the same right and left in America, but in Israel, the right is talking about security uh, and, and identity. Also an element that is very true and very important. And you have the religious and the secular. The religious are talking about being interconnected to something more spiritual, more divine, uh, greater than oneself, uh, being connected to our traditions and to our culture and to our values and to our laws. And the left is talking about, you know, the, the, the not the left, the, the, the secular is talking about, uh, you know, being interconnected with the rest of the world and being involved with business and science and math. And again, these things don't oppose each other. They're actually very important. And so we need to understand that the true way of understanding our culture is a more holistic way, not one versus the other, right versus left, both extreme, polarized against each other, fighting each other, but allowing a space for all these truths to exist and to see them all as a puzzle piece of one greater image and to have that conversation as a generation in order to find that image and to develop it and to reach it one day. Right, so now if you're a secular person who's not really connected to their Judaism and wants to learn more, do more, where do you think that person should start? I think that's a very individualized question. I think a person needs to understand also that their ability to impact also evolves with time. It's not something that you know, is stagnant. It's not you're good at this, do this, but to figure out the problems that exist around you, both uh, in your life, uh, both in your family's life, in your friend's life, in your workplace life, in your, the country you reside in, in uh, the, the world that you reside in. There are many problems that are affecting all of us, like right now the coronavirus or you know, all sorts of humanitarian problems that exist, environmental problems that exist, economic problems that exist, health problems that exist. Uh, so you have many ways of being able to help. And I think it's not about someone's level of observance. I think that's the relationship between an individual and a higher power and the way they express that in order to become a better person. Um, I, I, for me, this word religious, what does it mean to be religious, right? You can be religious about watching sports. You can be religious about following politics. So what does religious really mean? It really means doing something to the fullest of what you believe in. So someone that is considered secular to someone that is more religious but is doing something to the fullest of what they believe in they themselves are religious as well so and i think that's also an evolution with each individual what worked for me 10 years ago won't work for me in 10 years so was i more religious then than now not necessarily you should always be true to yourself and i think that's a individual journey that everyone goes through and everyone has their own flaws some people have more some people have different flaws and we need to grow with that uh, so i think the person needs to ask themselves uh, what are the problems that exist around me? What are the strengths that I have? What are the strengths that I can acquire? 
right? This ability to speak is not something that I always had. Uh, it's something that I had to work hard and develop. I'm actually an introvert. My, my, my go-to uh, nature is actually to not to be all in the open and to like have deeper conversations, but oh, wow. in smaller circles, but I had to, yeah, I had to develop this part of me to be able to, to articulate myself. If you see me in public, by the way, I'm usually the quietest person. Um, you would never I'm know. Debating someone. <laughs> unless, unless I'm debating someone and that's where I have to like, you know, find the, the strength that I had to develop in order to come out and to, and to be able to, to express myself. Uh, so everyone has to understand who they are uh, understand their strengths and their weaknesses, work on their weaknesses, uh, you know, even sharpen their strength and figure out how to make the world a better place on many different levels and many different times. Amen. I love that you've created these like courageous conversations. What got you into starting conversations with people, especially really deep conversations that most people are scared to have? Yeah, uh, for me, I do it from a place of, there are many layers as to why I do it. One, when I have these conversations, I learn a lot from them. Even if the individual that I'm speaking to might be so anti-Semitic, they might be saying things that I had never heard before. And so I need to be aware of these arguments being made to perpetuate xenophobia against the Jewish people in order to better educate myself and others around of how to deal with them and how to respond to them. So one, I'm doing it to educate myself. Two, there are many people around. And even, you know, a lot of individuals that I've spoken to have changed, right? Have been able to realize that, uh, uh, that Israel isn't bad, that the Jewish people aren't bad. And I come into a conversation already understanding that it might be that person's first experience with a Jew. And it might be those around listening, their first experience with a Jew. And it might also be their last experience with a Jew. And so in that moment, all of us that have that conversation, uh, it becomes our responsibility to best articulate our narrative, our story, our culture, who we are to that person and to those listening in order for us to make the world a better place. And so I take out ego completely out of it. A lot of people ask me, this is one of the top questions that I get. How do you stay so calm? Uh, because usually when you're, you're, you're confronted with something that's so opposing to who you are, you get frustrated. And for me, I stay calm. One, I've always been a very balanced individual, uh, just myself as my own personality but because i realized that i represent a lot more than myself in that moment and i have to do the best job that i can to represent my people and if i lose my cool and get physical and get into a, a, a verbal altercation then what is that going to do that's just going to fuel my own ego and make myself feel good but that's not going to do anything so i i understand the situation that i'm in i take a step back even before entering that conversation and even when in it, I understand what is going on around me. And after making a few of these videos to educate people, uh, I started realizing how much it really impacts others. Like I get thousands of messages constantly of, uh, you know, you've changed my life. You, I understand who I am. And I, I didn't invent these ideas, right? I'm not, a, you know, I wasn't born with this. I, I was just able to understand and to learn and to grow and to put things together. And there are many other individuals that do this now and throughout history and that will do that in the future. And I'm trying to help empower others. One of the, 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 the quotes that I most connect to is a true leader does not create more followers, they create more leaders. And that's part of what I'm trying to do with the, the work that I do. Amen. Um, what's been the most difficult conversation or situation you've found yourself in from engaging in these conversations with people that have contrasting views? Um, difficult. It could be sometimes when I've never heard something before. I don't have a response to something. Um, and I don't see that as something negative. I see that as something like positive, like, wow, thank you for the experience of uh, being able to, to to learn something new or to experience something new and that makes me then go and dig and, and, and understand more and do more research and, and find the answers to something. So, you know, all of us want to be right. All of us want to be all-knowing, but we will never, ever, any of us be all-knowing or completely right. Uh, so we have to also understand that when we're in those conversations, when you experience something where you don't know, that's not necessarily something bad. At first, uh, something that I was struggling with uh, because it was more personal is when Jews became anti-Israel, which is a whole other topic that can be broken down. Um, the way I understand it today, whereas at first when I experienced it, I was like, how? How could, how could you do that? Uh, how could you be that? How could you be against your own identity, your own people after everything we've been through? Uh, and so to understand that throughout time, 
first of all, there are a lot of Jews that are misinformed. A lot of the world is misinformed on a lot of different issues. So if you're taught that this thing is bad or these people are bad or this country is bad or this movement is bad, then that's what you know. That's all that you can then relate and communicate is what you were taught. So there's a lot of misinformation that is there. A lot of young Jews today, especially in the diaspora, especially in America, are more to the left, not necessarily because they identify with the politics of the left, but because the left, at least even in politics, is talking about something that is more humanistic, that is more inclusive, that is more talking about you know rights. And, and that's why a lot of people get trapped into being pulled to the right or to the left, rather than to understand that both of them are important and there's no extremes and there's no real right or left. We're all people and we all have our own ideas and we should never be sheep. But when they come to a college campus and they're told, if you want to support black rights and LGBTQ plus rights and Native American rights and women rights, you also have to be anti-Israel. And one, that's all that they hear. Two, that's what they think is good. Three, if they break out of that, it comes with social consequences of losing your friends and being seen as something bad. So there's a lot of things that build up into it. But to try to dive into a more psychological understanding of why Jews become anti-Israel, uh, there's something called the Stockholm Syndrome, uh, where let's give an analogy of, of, of a woman, let's say, that is married to an abusive husband. There are four ways in which this woman can react to this horrible experience. Uh, there's leave, there's fight back, there's pretend that it's not that bad and make excuses for it, or there's the worst is blame yourself for what's happening. And that's the same thing we see with Judaism when it comes to the passed down generational trauma that we all hold and the trauma that we still experience today. And there are four ways to react to it. There's leave, go to a different country when you're being oppressed, just migrate to a new country, or today go back home to Israel. There, and some people, obviously most people, I think go back to Israel for a different reason than persecution, but some people do as well. Uh, there's fight back, which is something that I try to embody. Uh, to stand up to it and to resist it and not allow it to happen and to prevent others from dealing with it as well. Because uh, that individual that is abusing that woman, if that woman leaves, he'll do it to other people. So there's some sort of justice that has to be taken care of. You can't just leave. Uh, so fight back. Um, pretend that nothing is happening. This is something that I was hearing constantly from the Jewish community when I was at UCLA and even at Columbia. Oh, don't do anything about it. It'll just go away. Uh, so pretend that it's not that big of an issue. And the fourth, which is the worst, is uh, side with your oppressor and make excuses for it. Oh, no, it's my fault. Oh, it's because I'm doing something. Oh, if I didn't answer back. Oh, only if I didn't do this. And that's also what's plaguing the Jewish community. That's what happens usually with any sort of trauma. And the Jews have not only the trauma they experience with anti-Semitism today, but they carry a very heavy load of passed down generational trauma that we've been going through through thousands of years that we still carry to this day that we have to unpack understand, deconstruct, and also go through a process of decolonization. Now, talking about pain and suffering, uh, what do you feel like most individuals that you speak to especially um, are thinking when they're blaming the Jewish people for their pain and suffering? Yeah, anti-Semitism can basically be described as whenever a community uh, takes the suffering that they experience that they see and they blame that on the Jews. And you see that happening from all sorts of extremes. You can even look at, again, the extreme right and left. The extreme right sees the Jews as the evil communist and the extreme left sees the Jews as the evil capitalist. And in a extremist nationalist based on race, which I don't even believe in the concept of race, of division of populations based on pigmentations of skin and genetical features. Like for me, that concept even is ridiculous. But even those that really identify as white or really identify as black or really identify as whatever, if you look at even in the extremes of these populations, of these demographics, they're usually the biggest problem and the biggest enemy that they have is the Jew. So Jews are, are always seen as the evil that is caused, the suffering that is caused, even in religion, right? Uh, in Christianity, the Jews are blamed for killing Jesus, although uh, it was the, the Romans that killed Jesus. And some people say, no, well, the, the rabbis had uh, told the Romans that they should kill Jesus. Well, one, the rabbis that were in charge, the real leadership were actually in hiding from the Roman Empire. But those that were in charge uh, were those that the Romans had imposed. Of course, when you have an empire and the Romans had colonized Judea, 
you wouldn't allow the true leadership to rule because they would want to be free. You would want the puppets, those that agree with your rule, to be the ones that ruled. And in order to then convince the population now that had adopted Christianity through Rome, that the Romans weren't responsible for the death of Jesus, let's blame it on the Jews and say that they had suggested it. So we see anti-Semitism happening all throughout and it can be explained, but there are many layers, I think, as to why anti-Semitism occurs. Uh, there's a, a jealousy element, right? Where Jews are 0.1% of the world's population. We're 15 million Jews, and there's about 7 billion people on this planet. And that makes us 0.1% of the world. And so to understand that we're 0.1% of the world, yet we hold a very... Uh, relevant place in all sorts of sectors, whether that be in physics, whether that be in, uh, in, in arts, whether that be in, in politics, whether that be in finance, like how are we so, you know, we, we're not the majority, but if you look at terms of population of this population is 0.1 and they hold this much amount, there's, there's jealousy that comes from that. And a lot of people say, oh, well, the Jews think that they're genetically dis predisposed to uh, being better. And that's, very not Jewish concept. We believe that we're all a part of one. We're all created in the image of oneness. Uh, we're all equal. Uh, so it's a very non-Jewish concept to think that. But the way I describe it is if you look at the way Jews are raised, uh, even like right now, most people in first world countries are literate, but that wasn't the case hundreds of years ago, right? Most of Western civilization, people were illiterate. Only a certain class uh, had the privilege of having that education, but all Jews were literate because all Jews had bar and bat mitzvahs and all Jews had to learn to read and write. And so that was an element that we were uh, more educated, right? In our culture, it teaches, uh, I mean, the Jewish mother in the household for the most part teaches their kids that you can accomplish anything that you want in life and you need to strive to be the best that you can be. And you know, not all families have that. And we also tend to help one another, of course, not all Jews help one another, but for the most part, we do. We stick together. We help one another. And that's something that you can hear even in, in rap music. A lot of African-American people of color, Black people in America try to even communicate that the Jews found the answer to rise up in white societies and in societies that they're not native to and help one another in order to rise up. And we must emulate that in order to help our society and our community do that as well. So there are many elements that allow us to be successful, even amongst the harshest of experiences. Um, Anti-Semitism can also be, be seen coming from a place of, uh, of, of seeing Jews as traitors. And I think this is because there's a, a misunderstanding as to who the Jewish people are. Uh, this is actually, a, I can give a personal example where I was having a conversation with my grandmother and she was born in Algeria, moved to Morocco when she was young and then had to flee Morocco after the, the, the pogrom, the massacre of Ujda. And she basically grew up up in France with my grandfather and my mother was born and they grew up in mostly south of France. And if you, and then I asked her, you know, grandma, you know, you always say that you're Jewish. I know that you're Jewish before everything, but why do you still say that you're French? Why do you, why do you like proclaim that you're French? You weren't born there. You didn't even like really grew up there. And she's like, well, France gave me everything that I have. And I was like, okay, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's who you are. It can be an element of your identity and experience, but why do you answer that you're, you're so French? And she's like, well, it gave me everything. And I was like, well, you know, it, it gave you everything. But if you were born a generation earlier, it would have taken everything from you. The generation, even your generation, when you were born, if you lived in France, you would have been killed for being a Jew. So does being French, it, does that mean a temporary status where you are considered kind of an equal if you like don't even show your Jewish uh, identity? Is, is that what being French means? And I was like, you know what, Let, let's do a test. Uh, grandma, you know, I, I obviously speak in French to her. Uh, if you go to a market and you have an avocado that you see produced in Israel, produced in France, and produced in Uruguay, which one are you going to buy? And she says, the one, the one produced in Israel, I want to help and invest in Israel. I'm, okay, if uh, you have your son, my uncle, and he, let's say, is 18 years old, and there's a war that France is fighting in, and there's a war that Israel is fighting in, which one, if you had to send your son to, which war would you send him to? Which country would you defend? She's like, I would send him to Israel. Okay, let me ask you another question. If there's a family that's in need, right? A family that's in need that's in uh, Argentina that's Jewish and a family that's in need that's French in Paris but isn't Jewish. Of course, if you could help, you would help everyone. You wouldn't only help the Jewish family. But if you could only help one, which one would you help? And she said, I would give it to the Jewish family because even though they're not my 
countrymen, they're, they're my family, they were Jews. And I was like, you see, grandma, in theory, you say that you're French, but in practice, you're not. And I think to those that are truly French, they experience you as a traitor because they see that you're saying that you're French, but you're acting not as a French person. And I think we need to clarify as Jews, and of course, this is in my opinion, people can disagree, uh, that we need to clarify that we live in other societies and we must be productive in those societies and help those societies. And we're definitely not the enemies of any societies, but to be clear about who we are. And I think if we clarified who we are, it would prevent that. And then I think there's the last more metaphysical element. Of course, there might be many other layers that I have not uh, understood yet or, or come to the knowledge of, but the more metaphysical element is, is when, let's say the entire world is a body, a human body, and each nation is an organ in that body. If an organ is not uh, functioning properly, the body rejects that organ. Even in a transplant, if the, the organ doesn't fit well with the other organs, then the body rejects it, fights it. There are antibodies that go to kill that organ. And the Jewish organ is, because it was broken so many times, we're not functioning correctly. We need to heal our organ and to figure out what is our collective purpose. Who are we? What is our organ's purpose? What is our, yes, we're a part of one world. Absolutely. But we also have our own role and our own special thing to bring to this world like other organs do. Each organ is important. And I think when we cure ourselves and figure out who we are and what we're supposed to do, I think that the body will stop rejecting us and we will see a lot of less anti-Semitism. Wow, that's such an amazing perspective. I was actually going to ask you about like your ideal world. Like what would that look like? And what is our responsibility as individuals? Because we're all different Jews from different backgrounds, right? Like I'm multicultural, I'm half Latina, but my mom's Jewish, Gabby, you know, like we- Russian, we, German, Ukrainian. We're all over the map. Yeah. So I, I was listening to your webinar and it's like, how do you create this oneness if we're all so different? Like, what does that ideal world look like? And what is our responsibility as individuals to cultivate our Jewish identity? And like, how do we do that? I think that's the main question. Yeah. So I think the, the, we can coexist as both being one and more than one. The same way you are you, but also in your family, you're your family. And that is also one unit. And you can also be in a society and that's one unit and in a country and that's one unit and in a region of the world and in uh, a, 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 the world itself is one unit. So there is a symbiosis between an individual and a unit, even in our own bodies, we have organs, even the organs, they're, they're, you know, all these different little atoms that make up different molecules that make up different, you know, cells in our body, and they all work together in order to produce something. So uh, my view on the world is that we're basically one body, we are all different organisms that live in this body that are part of this one body. And I think that's what Judaism believes when we believe in one God, it's not one individual God. It's not this human. It's not this being. It's not this uh, person that we need to look up to and fear. It's the concept of oneness. We, when we believe in Hashem, it's the belief in oneness. So it's actually not monotheism. It's panentheism. And I think that's a, a big misconception that a lot of even Jews don't understand that, is that we're not believing that there's one individual up there that is God. Because in our belief, Hashem, God, is, has always existed and will always exist and is a fundamental part of every single being and structure. And, and how can we com comprehend as, as human beings something that has always existed? I think uh, mortality, something that will always exist is a lot easier, but really to try to comprehend something that has always existed, we, we can't even have the comprehension of that. So we have to understand that what oneness really is, is way beyond our level of comprehension. And that oneness of all being united is what will allow us to be able to achieve something better. And that's the concept of Mashiach uh, for the Jews. It's not the concept of this individual comes and all of a sudden everything becomes bad and then becomes good. It's more so an achievement. The nations, the organs of this world find a way to uh, coexist and to function and to end the darkness that exists, whether that be poverty, sickness, uh, jealousy, all sorts of bad things that plague this world, um, over, overly materialistic world, you know, things that are plaguing us and finding the way that we can all coexist. And again, how that will look like, I, I have no idea, um, but I try to do everything in order for us to push in that direction and to try to get the generation to come together to find out what that answer is. I think, you know, Gabrielle and I, we 
we take to our classes and like we didn't grow up religious but like learning to our listening to different speakers connecting with jews having conversations what steps like that do jews need to take in order to connect more with their identity i think that was more my question yeah again it could be different for for different people uh, a lot of people are very religious when it comes to torah and the, what people consider today in pop culture to be religious and a lot of people have a lot of rejection to it and I think a reason why some people have a rejection to it is because the way it was taught. Uh, I think Judaism is, is something that is liberating, uh, something that is, that is positive, that is freeing, and not something in the way that it's usually taught uh, that is restricting um, and, and, and something that is negative. So a concept, for example, of Shabbat, which is the day of rest, uh, I often say this, uh, we invented the weekend, not the artist, but the concept of, uh, of resting for at least one day during the week. Um, and when I look at Shabbat, part of Shabbat is also not to spend money, which I don't see it as a restrictive element. I see it as a part of disconnecting from materialism, spending time with my family. Um, and so if you look at this one concept, there are parts of Shabbat that people have translated and interpreted that I disagree with, but specifically the element of not spending money. The concept is beautiful if you understand it and you apply it in your own way and you don't have to apply it, but if you do in that way, it's, I think it's a beautiful concept. And then there's a generation of rabbis that say, you know what, in order for us not to break this law, because it's a law and if we break it, some force is gonna come and smite us, we're going to add another law. And the law is that you can't even touch money because if you touch money, you might spend the money. And then the next generation of rabbis in order to one up the rabbis before them, they're gonna say, you know what, we're gonna add another law. You can't even look at the money because if you look at the money, then you're going to touch the money. And if you're going to touch the money, then you're going to spend the money. And then another generation of rabbis are going to say, you know what? You can't even have money in your house because if you have money in your house, then you're going to touch the money. And if you're going to touch the money, you're going to spend the money. If you're gonna... And you completely forgot the beautiful concept of not spending the money in the first place. And you're doing things out of a place of restriction. And I think that's why a lot of Jews have a very difficult relation with Torah and understanding uh, of our culture. And, and, and because of that, they kind of reject it completely. So I don't think there's one way of studying Torah, of, of, of being an individual. I think everyone has their own evolution. And I think the, the beautiful, uh, the way I understand it is actually through our name Israel, which is actually also happens to be my Hebrew name. And Israel is a Hebrew word that means Yashar La'el, Israel, meaning straight path to Hashem, to God. And so where does this name first come? It's actually the name of Jacob, which is the son of Isaac and the son of Abraham. Now, why does Jacob get this second name? Because in our culture, basically Abraham is the founder of our civilization, this understanding of panentheism, that Islam is also uh, panentheism. Islam uh, sees also the world as oneness and Allah being Hashem, being this oneness that, that exists because it's an Abrahamic uh, tradition and faith that comes from, from Abraham. But if we break down, Abraham passed down his traditions to Isaac. And Isaac just accepted everything that his father gave. And of course, we can't prove this factually. I'm just talking ideologically as to what we see our culture and our values and where we get a lot of our understandings as to who we should be. And Isaac, when he passed down the teachings to Jacob, Jacob didn't just accept it. He wrestled with it because he's like, I'm not just going to be told what to do. I want to understand it in my way. I want to wrestle and evolve with it in my way. And that's the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel. It's not a literal physical angel. It's this energy source of this oneness that he was wrestling with. And once he wrestles, he climbs up the ladder and he reaches the source. He reaches the oneness. And so the point of why we're called not only the children of Israel, but the nation of Israel is that as a nation, both as a collective and as individuals within this, within this nation, we have to wrestle with this concept of oneness and we have to wrestle in order to grow, in order to evolve, and in order to apply these things in order to be a better human being. Wrestling, Gab. <laughs> <laughs> wrestling with oneness, I love that. <laughs> in industry, I know a lot about. Um, yeah, I mean, everything you've said is, is beautiful. I did want to ask you a question about our current climate. So we know everyone's currently dealing with coronavirus on a, a global scale. And you did mention the Mashiach. So do you believe that this is the time of Mashiach? And what is the ultimate message with everything that we're going through right now? I definitely think uh, the world is going towards this age. But again, for me, the concept of Mashiach is not someone comes and the world becomes bad and then the world becomes good, but is an achievement. 
it's sort of like it's a process you eventually get there if you deserve it if you achieve it and once the world is fixed once we're able to coexist and to stop with this jealousy that we have between each other and this competition and to also understand that there is an individuality element that exists you should have also you know to have zero ego you would just never eat never sleep never think never do anything ego is also important but a balance and i think uh, if you look at the symbol of the magen david right most jews don't even know what this symbol means and it's not only a jewish symbol it's actually you can find this all over india it's a kabbalistic symbol that connects the the concept of spirituality the triangle pointing upward to the sky and physicality a triangle pointing to the ground and the balance between the two and if you look at two places like in the far east uh, you look in the Tibetans, monks, and uh, people that are meditating and fasting for a very long time. They're definitely connected to something very spiritual, no doubt. But they're too much in the spiritual because they removed all uh, possibilities of the physical. Like they were, life is a gift. It's beautiful. You were given this life to do something. And if you look in the West, uh, you look at even what is supposed to be spirituality through religions is has become physical. And everything is about materialism and getting this and the new car and the new house. And, you know, if you're all about the physical and no spiritual and understanding of a greater good, then you're completely disconnected and you're a, a, an empty vessel wandering or you're a soul that needs a vessel and is not. But you have to find the balance between the two. And that's what our symbol of the Magna David actually represents is finding that balance. And, you know, that's kind of what I think we need to use as a philosophy in order to achieve as individuals and as a collective a family and as a collective nation and as a collective world. And once we do achieve that in whatever way comes, I think that's the process of one day achieving this concept that we have, this philosophical concept of Mashiach. Wow. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. drop the mic. <laughs> man, let's just move on. Everyone just find balance. Wow. Great. Ali, is there any other um, areas you want to go over here? No, I think that this was a really thorough, we went through a really thorough process. There's a lot to digest. Maybe just some simple steps that people could take right now to become more connected to their Judaism. What would you suggest? Because a lot of people aren't as engaged as you. So how do we, especially in the United States, you know, people are like, oh yeah, I'm Jewish, I'm Jewish. <laughs> so how do we, I mean, I used to be like that too. Like, what does that even mean to be Jewish? What are some simple steps that people can take in order to start discovering their identity a little bit more and to become more connected to their Judaism? Yeah, it's a very good question that I don't necessarily have the answer to. The way I try to get people to come to it is I create the content that I do. Um, and a lot of messages that I get is I saw one video and I just started binge watching all these videos and I've been like so hooked and I did a video on what is Judaism and breaking that down because a lot of people that think they're Jewish, the ish is not what we think it is. It's not bluish, like kind of blue. Ish in Hebrew is ish, man. We're Jewish men and women. We're, we're, we're beings. So we even don't understand what it means to be Jewish, a man of Jewish faith or a human of Jewish faith. And, and we need to understand like who we are. And I think it's, it's a process of decolonization. I wasn't born with all these ideas. If you had a conversation with me at 15 years old, I, I wouldn't know all this stuff. And there's, again, a lot more than I need to learn. And, and, and I think we need to educate, like all, all of us. Uh, there are many misconceptions that come when, in, when you're talking about being a Jew, including like being white, right? We have this concept of Jews are white all of a sudden. Well, when we're talking about someone being white, we're not talking particularly about someone's skin tone because there are very white passing uh, people that are you know Latin American there are very white passing people that are even mixed uh, people of color black people there are many uh, Asians that have lighter skin pigmentations than European white people so when we're talking about someone being white it's not only about their skin tone it's more so about their origins and their status and if we look at the origins of the Jewish people, we might have had experiences elsewhere, but we genetically, culturally, historically originate from the Middle East. We're Middle Easterners, even our DNA, the Ash even the Ashkenazi Jewish DNA, which is just one part of the Jewish body, right? Some, some Jews had an experience in Europe, some Jews had an experience elsewhere, but those are the Jews that are usually the, most, the more white-looking Jews or the, the lighter-skinned Jews. 
and there are many Ashkenazi Jews that are dark-skinned. But if we look at those Jews, genetically, they're more closely related to Arabs in Saudi Arabia than they are to white Europeans. And Ashkenazi DNA can be found, and it's basically Levantine Middle Eastern DNA that has been displaced and stayed in uh, Europe for so long, but it's not originally European. So in terms of our origins, we're not white because we're not from Europe. But even in white societies, we were never white. We were not allowed to participate in agrarianism, which was the way people would trade and, and, and have cattle and trade their cattle and grow crops and trade crops. We were not allowed to own land. Um, you know, even more recently with the Holocaust, we were killed because we were not part of the Aryan race. We were not white. And, you know, even today with anti-Semitism in a white society, like some Jews can be white passing. But the second they find out you're wearing a Magen David or a Chai, the second they find out you have a kippah or you're dressed modestly, the second they ask you what is your name and you say, oh, my name is uh, uh, Shira or my name is uh, Yossi or you, you have a very Jewish name or a last name, then all of a sudden that comes with also anti-Semitism that you might face. And it's not the same as, as racism. You know, a lot of white society today in this generation is having a conversation around racism that exists in white societies, but we should only not look at uh, xenophobia of different communities through the lens of racism because racism can be experienced daily because you see right away that they're different because of their skin pigmentation but being Jewish might not be noticed right away and our experience with xenophobia in a white society might not be constant but the way it happens it actually is like this whereas we might be fine for a generation or two and the second that we're not fine six million of us die so we need to understand who we are, ask us these deeper questions and go on a path of decolonization and having a conversation of now that we're coming back to who we are mentally and physically, uh, what do we want to be? Like, yes, there are things that we picked up along the way that is not true to who we used to be. Do we want to incorporate that and infuse them into who we are now? Like a lot of things are great that exist elsewhere in the world. Like we shouldn't go back completely to what we were, but have that conversation now as a generation. Um, and I think a lot of people uh, have to, unfortunately, experience anti-Semitism in order to have that click. Uh, we see that through the story of Moses. We just had Passover. Moses was raised in the palace, right? And he had to experience uh, the, the, the beating and the murder of a Jew by the hands of an Egyptian slave master to have this, wow, this eureka moment of, I understand now I have to go on this journey of finding out who I am. Even Herzl, who experienced the Dreyfus trials, who saw... Uh, who was a journalist at the time and saw Dreyfus, who was a French officer, being tried and convicted just because he was a Jew who was actually innocent and being, you know, completely uh, embarrassed and humiliated in front of a French crowd that then chanted, Mort aux Juifs, death to Jews. And when he saw that, that's what made the click. Or for me, when I went through that experience at the age of seven, that's when I had the click. My, maybe I would have gotten to those conclusions, maybe not. Maybe I had to go through that experience. So uh, I think I, I'll ask you, a question in response to the question as Jews usually do, uh, you know, if we have anti-Semitism that exists almost as like a plan B, right? We're going on a path. We know who we are. We know what our purpose is. We get off that path. We forget who we are. We forget our purpose. We forget our identity and we get slapped by anti-Semitism and it forces us to go right back on the path. If that's plan B, what is plan A that we no longer need to go off the path? And that is a question that I've been asking myself for a very long time that again, I think is a generational answer that we have to come to. I think it's exactly what you're saying is get curious, have conversations, start to research your history. What does it mean to be Jewish to you? What, like start studying the Torah, listen to your, um, like the different, like, uh, like your Instagram, follow videos. I think it's just getting curious and finding your own connection with Judaism so that you can have smart conversations with people, especially when you're met with anti-Semitism. I think it's, it's education and conversation. Yeah. And I also think that we shouldn't be hiding from people or the expectations we feel like people have of us. I know for a while, even growing up, it's like scary. Do I wear a, a, a Jewish star right now? Like, is someone going to judge me? I don't have a common Jewish first name. But you always have these thoughts in your mind. I know in the secular world, a lot of people are nervous about these things. I was at a convention a few months back and another Jewish woman who had a business and was a vendor at this convention had said to me, you know, I love your Hamza and the Jewish star in the middle. She's like, I feel like inspired that you're wearing this. Like, I feel like I could be comfortable and wear this in this setting where, you know, 80%, 90% of the people here are not Jewish. But I think we need to be more comfortable with who we are and uh, be the light because 
that's what the Jewish people are. And it starts with one person. Like you, Rudy, are an example of that. Like you are a light and you are spreading that light. And I think that that's what we need to do. We need to be comfortable in our Judaism and in what we know about our identity. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Rudy, for you know taking the time. I know it's really late in Israel, and you were on a three-hour <laughs> webinar right before this. How do people find you? Tell us a little bit about like your social media platforms and how people can follow your stuff. Yeah, they can go to my Facebook, uh, type in my name, Rudy Rockman. Follow me on my public. Don't add me on my private. I won't accept you. Uh, on my Instagram, you can follow me at Rudy underscore Israel. Israel is my Hebrew name. That's why it's Rudy underscore Israel. It's not just that I love Israel. Uh, on Twitter, uh, and yeah, on YouTube as well. Follow my YouTube. I need to get, uh, like your YouTube, I need to get my, my views up and my, my subscribers up. But those are all the platforms that exist today in order to disseminate information. And those were, that's where you can follow me. And anyone can message me also. I answer back everyone, even though sometimes it takes a little bit of time because there's a lot, but uh, I try to get back to every single person. Amazing. Amazing. What about you, Ali? Oh, well, you can follow me on Instagram at Ali V Health, which is A-L-I-E-V Health. And then you can also follow me on Facebook, Ali Valerio or Ali V Health as well. Yep. And you guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Gabby Lauren TV. And make sure to subscribe to our channel here for Breaking Bread with Ali and Gabby. And we'll have more fun content coming your way soon. Thanks again yeah. from... Gabby and I are your two favorite Jewish girls. Yep. <laughs> Bye, guys.